Call the meeting to order at 1807. 1807. Well, we don't have a quorum, so we guess we can't approve. We'll last approve month. minutes next meeting. Okay. How about the Zach report? The Zach report. <coughs> all right. It's kind of long, but we're just checking in. So, all right. Uh, Carolyn wanted me to mention our continuity of operations plan. I guess it's been a hot topic recently in small towns. Uh, just by nature of us being a public safety agency with a robust command staff and organizational structure, <coughs> continuity of government is, uh, or continuity of operations is pretty familiar to us. Uh, we've specifically made a transition here. We have physical copies of everything in the building, but I've scanned in and made anything electronic that was only a physical copy. Most things are PDF now. We ha have on-site backups and also off-site cloud backups for our entire file system. And all of our operational stuff day to day, our patient care reporting software, our scheduling software, our notification, our employee records, things like that are all cloud-based. So if something were to happen to this physical location, it, A, we could set up shop we can flip the switch anywhere that there's internet connectivity. So whether it's the town hall or the city of Greenfield, whatever it is, we can keep operating um, easily. And with our chain of command, myself and my deputy, we have full access to everything, um, redundant access, and then going down the chain of command, it, it tapers off as far as administrative access stuff goes. So. Um, I don't think we need to worry about continuing operations. Sounds like you got it all handled. It's great. All right, the new ambulance, um, which is replacing our 2010 International. Uh, we should expect to see it in March. The International is actually going to get stripped here in the next week or so of all of our equipment, and then it'll be brought down to New England Fire Equipment and Apparatus in Connecticut, which is our local dealer for the ambulance, the new ambulance that's coming. So the international get delivered down there, the new ambulance will get delivered there, and then that's where they do the final transfer of the power load stretcher, the narcotics safe, the radios, things like that. And then it'll be delivered from Connecticut up here, probably mid to late March, fingers crossed. And then we've got the process of inspection and licensing for that. And I've seen it happen both ways. I've seen Phil Bonnie, the state inspector, say, I'm coming in June anyway. You can get a temporary license and waiver and operate it, and then I'll inspect it officially then. I've also seen him say, oh, I'll come in and inspect it today, and then when June comes around, I'll only inspect the other two. So we might see the new ambulance in service beginning April, or it might be um, a few more weeks after that. So we'll have to, we'll see how that settles. The hand-me-down police cruiser from the Deerfield Police Department is now ready to be put in service um, with 130,000 miles on it. It's just broken in. And I'm reminded that the, the engine was replaced 40,000 miles ago, so that is basically brand new. Um, and it's a great car. So uh, the final cost of all that stuff, so the police department stripped their items out. So they did the labor on that. They took out their radios, the cage, the radar, all that stuff. Um, and then it was still labeled Deerfield PD with the blue stripe, which was painted. So that went over to Greg's auto body. And they, to keep costs down, we only repainted that blue stripe to red. So we didn't do a full repaint, just mm -hmm. the stripe to red. And then we added our lettering, our decals. And that total came to $1,200 for all of that to repaint it and re-letter it. And then the warning lights that were still in it were all blue. Obviously, it was a police car, but we can't run blue to the front. So what we did was we only replaced the light heads that were like facing front. So anything facing rear, we weren't going to spend the money to mm -hmm. replace. So we only replaced the ones that were facing front, and we did it with like lower cost options where we could. And that car had an undercover light bar in the front that only <laughs> faced forward. So that had to come out. And so instead of replacing just that light bar, we put one on the roof that gave us 360 red. Um, so that light bar alone 
bare bones light bar was $1,999. That's the cheapest you can get them. And then we spent another um, thousand dollars on the other light heads, the siren, stuff like that. And then to install all those things, four people um, volunteered their day. They spent seven hours taking all the blue lights out, putting all the red lights in and reprogramming it. So we didn't pay anything to do that stuff. That was all um, volunteered by local people with expertise in that. We thank them very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, it's still, I know initially there was like way back when we were talking about this, there was a hope that we'd keep it under $2,500. <laughs> and I, you know, that was just impossible, but I, this was um, um, as cheap as we could do it. So yeah, I think the light bar on top, people may feel money is frivolous, but that 360 degree yeah, is right. something that's important, something yeah. that you need. And if we could get the name of the seven people, we should probably send some kind of a thank you. Four people, seven oh, hours. Sorry, yeah. four people. I, not that we shouldn't thank yeah. them. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, my number is confused, yeah. but we should do some, you know, yeah. send some kind of thank you. And yeah. Well, you know, and, and I mentioned the interior and the exterior bar because the to replace just that interior bar would have been twelve hundred dollars. So for the extra seven hundred, you're getting right. three times as much coverage as you would. Yeah. Um, so that's why I went with that. Okay. Um, so that's good. I you know that vehicle will reduce wear and tear on our quarter million dollar ambulances. It'll also reduce liability where we had people driving their personal vehicles to and from calls and on scenes and things like that. So now mm -hmm. we can do away with those headaches. Um, I did create a new. Carolyn had asked for the updated policy um, that reflected this new vehicle. Um, this is this is a new policy. It's just a use of department vehicles policy, um, and it says you can only operate a department vehicle. So it's universal, right? So mm -hmm. it works not just for the ambulances, but this and any future vehicles. Um, you have to be um, authorized and oriented on it. Have to be signed off. That all just folds right into our existing program. Anybody operating or riding in it. Um, is considered to be representing the department. So then that falls back on our policies as far as professionalism and representation, things like that. And then we say, um, basically anytime this, you think that you might be called upon to transport a patient to a hospital, you drive, you take an ambulance. So this vehicle is not, oh, I get a 911, I go to the scene and now I got to turn around. Nope. So the policy is very clear. And especially it also says if you're duty station or your duty obligations that day is to be on a transporting ambulance. That's what you're going to be operating. Right. Um, and then it goes on to say if, you know, the SUV would be for um, official business that would reasonably not result in the need to transport a patient to the hospital, um, such as, you know, going to the, going to Franklin Medical Center to exchange medications when you're the impact person and you're not first out you've already got a crew still maining a ambulance and things like that so um i think that that covers it you know and the last caveat down there is um, the use of any department vehicle that would remove it from the availability to respond to emergencies in our primary coverage area um, such as to or from training special events etc or that fall outside of typical on-duty crew responsibilities or otherwise outside this policy requires prior explicit approval by department command staff. So that would be, I want to take it down to Bay State Springfield to attend this m and that I, you know, it's like, okay, that falls within our policy, but it needs to be explicit because that, for obvious reasons, right? So that's the policy, presuming that well, um, we've had, I know in the past, our reports have wound up at UMass Medical or in Boston, yes, and we right. get a phone call. Right. We've got equipment here, what do you want to do? Right. Right. And actually, I um, I promised John Baturik that nobody, it wouldn't be in service until we took the blue lights out of it, but he gave me permission to drive it around. Um, and just the other day, we actually, we had a provider ostensibly stranded it in Springfield because they hopped on board Colerain ambulance as it went by with a pediatric trauma patient. They needed a second paramedic. They were going by our station. So they, so we put one paramedic on it right at shift change, mm -hmm. and she helped treat that patient, but it meant that she was stuck down at Bay State after her shift was over waiting for them to 
clean up and finish and do their report. So I just took the SUV down, zipped down, picked her up and drove her back, which mm -hmm. was perfect for that type of thing. So, okay. um, so uh, yeah, I mean, what kind of equipment you're going to put in here? So right now it's going to be, uh, nothing's in there yet. Once we strip the international, um, and we've got some extra gear laying around, it's basically going to be your first aid kit, your jump bag, O2 tank and, um, AED. Um, I can't do anything really more significant than that. I can't do medications with a cardiac monitor because it's not in a climate controlled secured facility as required by the regulation. So maybe someday we'll get there. We're going to carry as much as we can, uh, at least, you know, the, our life saving intervention stuff that uh, if somebody's comes across an, uh, an accident or they're in the vehicle and, and an incident comes in that they could at least save a life. Get started. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So we'll put that vehicle in service tomorrow, if uh, seeing no concerns on that. Uh, I've got a request into the Deerfield Select Board slash Town Administrator right now for um, the appointment of three new per diems. Um, I submitted that request at the beginning of the week. Their next meeting is on Wednesday. I asked for it to be added to the agenda, and I haven't seen an agenda posted yet. So I still don't know what the status was on that. If, if somebody from Deerfield shows up, Deerfield Select Board maybe can ask. But those three people um, are, <coughs> it's actually kind of a, a nice um, cross section of EMS career. So one person um, is a young man from town who went to Frontier, started off, doing the ride along with the school resource officer was really into public safety wanted to be a police officer and then he joined the south Deerfield fire department realized that he'd rather be a firefighter paramedic um because it's a better job and he's been very proactive over there comes um highly recommended he lives in town he's very excited um and i've been very impressed just checking his references so he'll be coming on as a brand new emt uh, to get his experience and he's hoping that he will continue on to paramedic school eventually um, the next person is um, the most recent full-time hire, the South Deerfield Fire Department. So he was required to get his EMT basic certification as part of his job there. And since getting it, he's fallen in love with it and he wants to keep his skills up and also be uh, a service to the community, he lives in the community as well. So um, we're gonna be bringing him on. And the third is um, a person who started life as an EMT, then as a paramedic on the student force in Amherst. He has since gone to med school and is now a ER physician resident down at Bay State in the trauma center. And he is at the point now in his residency where he's allowed to get a side job. And usually what they do is they get jobs at your like minute clinics and your AEIOUs. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, like paramedicine is you know, pre-hospital emergency is where my blood is. I want to keep doing that. So um, just based on our reputation, he reached out here to see um, what what options we have. And we certainly have a position for him. Uh, additionally, he's hoping that he will be a medical control ER, uh, EMS medical control physician in the future. So he's working on a uh, fellowship program now as, to be an assistant medical director out of Franklin um, Medical Center. So we're hoping that with him being here working as a paramedic in the very least, he brings an incredible set of skills, but maybe additionally, we will be a site for this MedCon fellowship program where the doctors, before they're asked to really be medical control, see what EMS is doing in the field, see what that looks like, see what challenges we have, and and basically be an internship place for medical control physicians. And in turn, it gives us not necessarily an expanded scope, but to have our medical control physician on scene with us to be able to give orders in real time, um, allow us to do exceptions to the policies. And even in some communities in other parts of the country, they're doing uh, significantly expanded scopes. So, you know, chest tubes or things like that, or, you know, that yeah. we would never be able to do as paramedics, but the physicians certainly can. So that's a uh, very exciting. Good addition. As well. yeah. yeah. And hopefully 
I'm thinking even further down the road, he becomes an advocate for EMS and yeah. pushing some of the things along, especially being in the rural part of the state where the hospital is not three minutes away like it is in downtown Boston. Right. He right. might be able to go back and advocate to the state to say, hey, we need some different policies here than what you've got there. So, And I think that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. the hope of this fellowship is that you know, medicine will come yeah. to this end of the state. Yeah, right. And, and that and that these physicians who oversee us know what it's like and know the challenges that we're facing right now. The only fellowship that really exists for this type of thing, um, while it's. Not too far away, it's in Worcester, they have a limited number. And the Bay State Health System has a teaching system for new doctors. Um, they're really excited about starting their own fellowship. So we, South County EMS could be the tip of the spear on that one. Excellent. Um, I saw headlights out there, but I don't know where they are. All right, so outreach. Uh, Steady. Uh, I was reminded recently I don't always do a good job of promoting these things, um, especially the way that the police department is able to. Uh, but, um, hi, Carolyn. Hey, sorry I'm late. I just had to vote the uh, capital improvement committee. Oh. So, welcome. Sorry. Eddie, help. Yeah. It's all right. Hey, before you get into that, just to yeah. back up a second. Um, the EMT that you'll need to appoint, yeah. who's full time with South Fairfield Fire. Yes. There's no conflict because he's paid by South Fairfield Fire. This is considered his second job. Yeah, so we've so already. We yes. have to deal with him paying overtime. No, no, no. Okay. So we've already worked out um, in writing and agreeing with South Fairfield Fire that for calls that occur in their district, mm -hmm. they have. The authority to respond to those that okay. when we're driving by the station there's even if he wants to run out the front door then hop on and respond as a South Deerfield fire employee mm -hmm. with their protections that he can respond treat and transport and it would be no different than if we had a serious call we toned for their assistance he arrived on scene okay. and we asked for so so we already had that in place his um, addition to our department means that he would also now on nights or weekends or days off, either be able to pick up shifts or respond to calls as they come in. So those days that we get slammed. Um, I'm yeah. all for it. I think it's a great addition. I think it's great cooperation before, between the agencies. And, yeah. Um, great step forward. Yeah. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm excited. I, Carolyn, real fast, the, the, uh, our updated policy, vehicle use policy, mm -hmm. um, is there and it's, uh, it's a universal policy that now includes this additional vehicle. So it basically, you know, I, I didn't rewrite a whole new policy just for an SUV. It just now includes that. Okay. And I had initially opened up by talking about our continuity of operations plan, um, which is incredibly robust and something we're used to exercising every day as a public safety agency and with chain of command and um, cloud-based operations we can we can set up shop anywhere else in a moment's notice if it has internet connectivity. Okay. Um, I just, so you actually have an official plan because I, we don't have it on file and that probably should be filed with our town. Let me, uh, let me find out if you want something on a specific format. I mean, we have a chain of command and an organizational chart and policies and procedures that you'd like, being in public safety, you read this and you're like, oh, if this person isn't available, this is the next person that, you know, we talk to. These are the people. This is how we access these systems. If we need it in a specific format for a coop, well, let me know. Well, I'm dusting off. This is truly old. I mean, we haven't used them since the H1N1 mm -hmm. from 2009. So right. we, that was the last time our coop plans have been um, really looked at. And approved so we have to bring it up to the select board and do another but this is would be for continuous operations of you know say weeks um, I, I don't know I think we used six weeks duration of you know crisis okay situation where you would enact the coop okay I mean it's all guesstimates no one knows what yeah really would and we don't even know this could be like the SARS and just die out uh, well, I'll 
I'll circle back around with that and figure right. out exactly what that needs to look like and, and so, we can make sure it's in the right format. I'm going to try to dig that out and look at it this next week because we have our tabletop on March 2nd. So you, you are planning to come still, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're, we'll do the tabletop and we'll pull out the coop as part of the tabletop. Okay. And coop being? Continuing operations plan. Okay. Oh operations. I just want to make sure in case anybody's watching oh. we're not talking in code. So yeah, chicken no. coop. Yeah. It's People just, think we'll buy chickens outside. Or no, something. no. Uh, it, there's just a lot of work and mm -hmm. we haven't we haven't formatted anything since two thousand nine. So as a select board, I'm the only one that was involved in it. So we have to have another vote of some sort. So don't put a lot of effort into anything yet. Okay. Let me look at what we got and the format and see how we integrate it. Sounds great. It should be something that would be on file at the town hall. Um, my, the, the three new appointees that I was talking about when you walked in, I put in a request to the town administrator for having it added to the next select board agenda. I'm not sure if this... The 26th, it should be on there, no problem. I, I haven't heard a reply back that it is and I went to go look at the agenda and I couldn't find the do agenda. Have, do you have the, um, I don't think it's been posted yet. Yeah, okay. That's. Do you have the names of the persons? I, I've got the whole, Okay. I can print out another copy of my request with all the information in it that you would get. So I just wanted to close that. Okay. So I'll just make sure that it's on the agenda. Um, I'll check tomorrow. Carolyn is now up to speed. Great. Yep. Uh, outreach. So uh, the Deerfield Elementary School Math and Science Festival is coming back around uh, normally. So we always do like presentations and we talk about public health and emergency medical services. And we always bring an ambulance uh, because the international is going away. We'll be down that third ambulance, which is what we use for these types of special events. Um, but um, we'll still send a crew over, including myself, and we'll just take our new SUV over and we'll throw some equipment in it and we'll figure out what our presentation will be without the ambulance. But um, it'll, I think, probably be 80 to 90 percent of the same stuff that we normally talk about. Uh, I participated in the now second annual Community Appreciation Luncheon at the Sunderland Elementary School. So they invite uh, public safety, elected officials, public officials to have spaghetti lunch with all the grades at the Sunderland Elementary School. How'd you fit in those little chairs? It's uncomfortable sometimes when you sit with the kindergartners, that's for sure. Um, but it's great because um, those kids get to see role models from all aspects. Um, Natalie Blyce was there. So, you know, they got to meet somebody who's a politician and elected, and they got to meet the town uh, administrator in Sunderland and what, you know, she does and in public safety. And so that's, we really enjoy that. That's put on by the Sunderland PTO. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I've got upcoming dates to um, start basically return to our uh, regular South County Senior Center um, involvement. We used to do that a lot more actively and then we had a couple things happen. We had some director changes over there and then our town nurse became much more um, close, intimate's not the right word, but with the people over there doing the blood pressure stuff, having kind of that more long-term care perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so us just showing up randomly and doing blood pressure clinics wasn't really appropriate with with her being there but I'm working on getting back in there I've also now come back around with triad so now I'm on the list so when triad goes over with the sheriff's department and the police departments South County EMS will also be represented and we thought that was going to be a, a good time oh, for that as well Zach, that's really good yeah and it was just one of those things where you know you don't mm -hmm. They didn't think to invite me until I was like, you know what, so, and, and now. So th we're looking forward to that. So we'll be, we'll be doing that. That's really great. Um, the other, again, just in case there is some kind of emergency, I really appreciate you getting involved, back involved with the senior center so that you can connect with the seniors yeah. in case we have to do some follow-up. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We, we haven't sorted all this out, obviously. We're just starting. Today was the first meeting, but you know, potentially we would be doing well-being checks from distances and stuff. So yeah. that would be wonderful. Uh, there was, uh, I just wanted to, I, I'm kind of revisiting, I, the special response team uh, integration 
to a true multidisciplinary, multi-jurisdictional countywide <laughs> response team, kind of one of the first and only of its kind, uh, pretty much as far as I know of in the country, really. Um, we've the EMS and fire department contingents. We've been meeting twice a month regularly. Uh, to practice our medical uh, assessment and treatment skills. We've also been doing physical fitness at 8 in the morning going for runs. That's a lot of fun. Uh, and promoting team cohesion. And uh, just recently, so we've been doing that to get up to speed with ourselves. And then just this past month, we have folded in with the law enforcement side as well. So we've been training them and teaching them on medical response stuff and uh, refreshing what they already knew and forgot they knew and kind of teaching them some new tricks and skills. And we've got a two-day combined training at the end of March. The law enforcement side, basically, they've decided to give up their two training days that are normally spread out over the month to hold two days back to back where they present to us and they train us. So we've been kind of teaching them. Now what's going to happen is they've been preparing presentations and slides and, and stuff like that. Um, and so we're going to go in and we're kind of seeing at the end of those two days, really that's when we're going to be like folded in. We still have a lot of work to do as far as policies and procedures and stuff like that, but it's, it's really exciting for everybody. And just to kind of revisit the way that the SRT is organized, um, we are organized in exactly the same way as the Franklin County Regional Technical Response, Technical Rescue Team is formed. And so, uh, unlike the state hazmat team, which is when it's activated, you're a state employee because the state has a funding source for that. Franklin County for the technical rescue team said, we need this resource in the county for getting people off of cliffs and out of holes, but we have no centralized funding source for it. And the amount of equipment and training needed is too much of a burden for one department to bear. And if there was a call and we, that whole department lost all of its people to that call, they'd have nobody left. So what they did was they said, here's what we're gonna do. Every department who wants to be a part of this you give us one or two people, you take on the burden and the responsibility for outfitting them and for training them, but if we all do that together, and then we channel our normal mutual aid procedure that we're used to using, when we all come together, we can form a team. It's not unlike South County EMS, really, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, the, that's how the SRT is formed. So just for the clarification on that, I, we've used all of the same technical rescue team language that's already been vetted and cleared um, and has been working for quite some time with um, the other departments. And this is the MOUs that we sign between each individual member of the team. And it's actually South County EMS. And then these are held together by the team leadership. And what it says is when you're when you're requested through this, it is a mutual aid request. You are an employee of South County EMS. You, we have our own internal policies and procedures, but you are still governed by your department's policies and procedures, regulations from OEMS in the state. There's nothing absolving you from your normal everyday duties. This just is that you are a South County person who also is familiar with these other people. And we still have obligations if they're injured and they still have obligations to conduct themselves in, in certain manners and, and ways. The reason why I just wanted Zach to bring it up is because when we were first talking about it, I'm 100% I'm 100, 100 supportive, still am supportive, but um, I just assumed that this was going to be what set up like the hazmat situation where the fire, um, you know, mass fire covers the hazmat um, participants. Yeah. Right. But we, we would own anybody getting we own the person, how they how they act, how they conduct themselves, as well as, you know, if they get injured. And I just wanted to clarify it so that we all knew that we were picking up these costs. I, I mean, I, I feel that it's worth it, but, um, you know, I felt I'm, I'm not a non-voting member of the Oversight Board, and so I felt like the Oversight Board should vote on this. That's all. I, I agree with what Zach's doing, I agree with the theory and the thought behind this. I mean, either we pay for our own, 
or if they set up some kind of a county fund, the towns, each town is going to have to pay into some kind of a county fund to go after it. Well, so, OEMS the, is working on um, setting up some kind of deal. You know, the Western Mass um, EMS office is mm -hmm. setting up, is trying to set up some kind of deal like the hazmat deal, where no one is going to be, you know, no individual agency is responsible. It's all, you know, going to okay. be covered ultimately. But that hasn't gone through yet. Yeah. And, um, so I just felt, if someone, obviously, if someone hurts themselves, you know, it, it's, I feel like we're obligated to pay. And I just wanted to make it clear that there, we would be obligated to pay, and there should be no question. Yeah, it'd be the same as a mutual aid cost. Well, I mean, right. essentially what you're doing could be covered under mutual aid. Well, that's exactly what it is. I mean, it's yeah. the type of thing where right. if something were to happen in Greenfield, they'd be calling us anyway. Right. At least by organizing this well, beforehand, we have experience working together. And this, and, and, this came yeah. up. It, the reason why this came up is because it came up in Homeland Security. We, we got a request from the um, Hamden County to cover some of the expenses of, of their doing exactly what Zach is doing up here, and and they wanted some equipment covered. And, they, and they, through the explanation, it came out that they that each the sending agency is responsible for anybody getting hurt or whatever, and 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 then there was no equipment set aside for it because it was EMS versus fire departments, mm -hmm. and so um, and that's when I found out that it's work they're working on it, but it has not gone through, and there's been no funding that's set aside yet for it, so we would be on the hook and i wanted it to be clear that we would actually if someone did get hurt we would actually pay and there would be no question that's all i, f I felt that was important that it was yeah. we acknowledge that we own the responsibility because we're asking people to get one additionally trained and then you know and then to respond and and we might need it someday and that that training also, you know, everybody is exposed to it down here. So I think it's, you know, ends up us being more professional in the end, and, and it's better, you know, going into situations that are more risky could happen down here just as well as in Northfield or just as well as in Greenfield. Sure. Apparently they've been deployed to Greenfield twice, Mongu once, and Northfield once in the last four or five years. So it's not like this is a huge thing. No, and, and right. Right, and and with with the increased knowledge base, they're hoping that you know even if it's not like say an active response, but that communities will start to say, hey, there's some expertise, some knowledge from this team. Let me just request that knowledge to the command post to weigh in on things. And so, yeah, yeah. You want to give the listening audience some examples of what you might be responding to as the SRT. So uh, it could be uh, any number of things. The, the SRT originated basically as a law enforcement example of what the fire service and even EMS has been doing for a long time through mutual aid and task force. So the police side said, you know, if, if we have somebody who runs out of the Northfield Police Department, you know, who had handcuffs on and they, runs across the golf course. And they, and they run out into the woods, the police departments historically haven't had a mechanism to ask for, you know, a first alarm fire response, and we know exactly what that looks like. So the police said, we want to create an SRT team, which is a group of individuals from multiple departments that can be called upon and, and all work together, have the same radio frequencies, things like that. By folding in fire and EMS, they're really looking at it as an all hazards thing. So it could just be where the law says if it's an criminal act, the police have jurisdiction. So it could be, say, somebody sabotaged a railroad bridge or something. And now the police are required and responsible for evacuating or putting up a, a, a cordon or, or something like that. And so the SRT is, hey, police departments, you're familiar with us. When you call us, we have manpower we have people we have ems now that thinks about oh we're going to be standing outside in the rain all day are they being fed are we keeping them warm we have the fire agencies who have access to drones for aerial imaging and things like that so um that's one example uh or among multiple examples um it, it's so it's so new and exciting it's it's tough to say exactly you know 
What are those? Mass casualty incidents. It could, yeah. Oh, so yeah, um, mass casualty incidents. Um, we've been training. Rescue task forces are an integration between police and EMS. So if you had a mass casualty incident, um, it trains police officers to provide protection to the rescue crews. And this streamlines that. So instead of everybody having their disparate trainings and then having to come together at an incident, through the SRT, we all train together and are used to one another if that incident were to ever occur. Well, it could be just a domestic and you're responding to a domestic in mm -hmm. one of our four towns and that extra training would make a huge difference. Um, some examples that we use, um, thank you for pointing that out, would be, so somebody who's, the police respond, like say for a domestic and somebody is holed up in their house and they refuse to come out. And you might call the SRT because, you know, they have the additional training, but now with our integration, we've got an EMS provider on the team that can do a remote medical assessment of any victim that's in there that can help talk through somebody over the phone, rendering medical aid to somebody that we can't actually get hands on and stuff like that. So, so that's why I feel like the training is very valuable. Um, it certainly outweighs the risk of someone slipping and falling or whatever. Yeah. But I, I felt like it had to be a formal decision of um, the the oversight board so that in case someone did get hurt there was no question I don't know. do we need if we need to vote on it we'll have to throw it on next month's agenda when we've got a quorum but if, it's there's, information. if there's no need for a vote then I think we're good okay. yeah I don't yeah I think it just has to be a formal acknowledgement a formal yeah. acknowledgement yeah but I, I don't, I don't yeah. think it requires any sort of approval um, all right uh, moving on, uh, so grant money, we love grant money, right? Uh, Lori Lankowski, who is the Emergency Management Director of Deerfield, has um, got grant money to purchase portable miniature carbon monoxide CO detectors um, that will clip onto our first in bags on all of our ambulances. This is something that fire departments have been doing a lot because they have used to these types of like CO meters and things and they carry them on their person and fire departments that have started putting them on their medical bags have actually documented saving lives from it. One is you go to a generic sick person with flu symptoms and you go in the house and now it's alarming you realize it was actually related to carbon monoxide and so it helps you assess and and diagnose the patient, whereas that might have been missed earlier on. The other thing too is I think it was Long Island where they actually saved lives. They went to like somebody had a laceration in the kitchen of a Applebee's or something, and when they went into the kitchen, their alarms went off. And so by just nature of being out in the community regularly with this equipment, they were able to identify a carbon monoxide leak in the kitchen that was um, hurting people. So Lori has um, got grant money, and we will be getting one CO detector for each of our ambulances, so three for our first in bags. Um, and the, the maintenance, we will be responsible for maintenance, which is minimal. Um, there's, a, there's like a cartridge in it that needs to be replaced every year, every two years. And then there's a weekly, or, or excuse me, monthly calibration check that needs to be done. But that's not any dissimilar from our blood glucose monitors that need to be calibrated on the same thing and we do regular ambulance checks so it'll just be folded into that so is there any opportunity on getting one for the SUV as well I <clears throat> great idea I'd have to check with Lori I don't know okay. um, if she just float the idea out yeah there. if we can great if not get a but I think yeah. it's a great idea besides saving everybody else it protects our personnel that too um, also, Lori's been working on, uh, it's called the AFG program, which is short for Assistance to Firefighters Grant. You've heard me say this before, and I'm going to say it again before the night is over, but historically EMS, Emergency Medical Services, has been, have been left out of a lot of opportunities for grant money, especially and some other things, just by nature of us being so new. That when these regulations and these laws were written, they said police departments and fire departments, um, and so the AFG grant program is a federal program that provides money to municipality public safety for 
uh, high dollar items, um, a lot of personal protection of equipment and vehicles. And they've just recently amended their language to also allow municipal EMS agencies. So we now qualify for these oh, grants, yes. which is amazing. And Lori and I have been talking, she believes that um, we're gonna miss all the deadlines for this year's grant submissions, but she, feels pretty confident that we'll be able to get at least some money for future vehicle replacements through this program, if not yeah. other equipment like diesel particulate source capture systems and things like that. The AFG is famous for paying for those systems. So um, this is this is new to us. This is an exciting avenue and, and kind of shows that we're getting recognized now as a bona fide public safety uh, agency. Um, and then lastly on the grant thing, I've I've got numerous requests and letters of support from our sister agencies, especially through the SRT stuff from now that we're actually coordinating police, fire and EMS agencies and building those coalitions um, that South County EMS as a true municipal regional service, like the first and only of its kind in Massachusetts, I've been asked to go to the Western Region Homeland Security Advisory Council and just inquire about the availability of block grant funding for an all-hazards response vehicle. So that is a, um, a request I'll be putting in actually for, I guess the next meeting is early March, so I'll have the request in very soon. But I've got letters of support from um, Amherst Police Department, Turner's Falls Fire Department, Greenfield Fire Department, Franklin County Sheriff's Office, American Medical Response, Bay State Health Systems, everybody is like, this is a resource that, this is an asset that doesn't exist in this region at all, period. So this is a vehicle that could be utilized to bring responders into dangerous zones and retrieve victims from these zones. Um, this vehicle is, it's a, Medivac by Lenko, um, and it's designed to, it has four wheel drive, it can withstand trees falling on it, it can ford water, it does have ballistic protection as well. We talked about, you know, if you go to a domestic, this vehicle would allow you to drive up to the front door, um, whereas you wouldn't have been able to do that in the past, or you can rescue people from scenes where historically we can't go in with an ambulance, where it's just not safe, but this would be able to drive right, right in. And it's designed um, to mimic the look of an ambulance and to be able to treat somebody on the inside. So it's long enough that you can lay somebody down. It's got high intensity LED lighting. It has onboard oxygen, has onboard suction, basically the same thing that an ambulance has. And there are, in the request that I'm putting in, there are specific times, whether it be the tornado in Conway or the flooding in Deerfield or the officer involved shootings in Orange that We've had to already make do in this county by using equipment that left us vulnerable or we were really just crossing our fingers on or we weren't able to retrieve somebody when we should have been able to, that this would, would have protected us and kept us safe. I, it's, a, it's an expensive item. Um, we're, not, we're not expecting it to be approved at the Western Regional Homeland Security Advisory Council. Um, it would be a significant portion of their block grant that they have available, but it's something that all of these communities feel very strongly in that we should have this resource in our region and that South County makes a lot of sense as a municipal 24 seven department that's centrally located that could, all of our people are all authorized to operate all of our vehicles. Um, so, you, if somebody needed it, if Coleraine needed it, if Amherst needed it, if Northampton needed it, if Orange, Greenfield, you could call and we could have it on the road in a moment's notice. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be one of those things where I think momentum is going to grow on this, and um, and we're just going to try for it. I I I don't want to depress you, but I'm, I'm, since I've been on the council, I'll just tell you right yeah. now, it probably is not going to happen. Only because yeah. we don't get that kind of money anymore. And that's fine. And that's, but, yeah. But what I'm saying is, I, that's not to say that we wouldn't be able to, to put some money up, like maybe 100000 or 50000 towards it and leverage yeah. some other money. And maybe this AFG kind exactly, of thing yeah. would pay for something like that. And, and that's what the proposal will, will reflect. I mean, like right now, I, I was asked to kind of get this in right now, kind of make the intentions of all these communities known. Um, 
And because of that, we don't have any other money lined up, but that this request is really, we see a need for this asset. All these signatories see the need, whether it's full funding, whether it's partial funding, whether it's tomorrow or five years from now, whatever it be that our intention is that the region should have this asset. So, um, Five or 10 years ago, we could have done it. But well, yeah, and I, mean, I think- we, just, we really just, yeah. believe it or not, uh, it's not a priority in the Trump administration. To well, I, the, security money. the other thing too is that the, kind of why this is renewed is we've got the SRT and five or ten years ago um, some communities did receive these and there's a similar vehicle but not the same operated by the Pittsfield Sheriff's Department. It is a shorter vehicle, it is, it's dark inside, it's painted like a tank, it's not designed to treat a victim or evacuate people, right? And there's only a handful of people on that whole department that are authorized to use it and they have you know miles of red tape in order to deploy it um, because they do see it as a law enforcement vehicle whereas this is a multi-jurisdictional all hazards response that you know we would be making available to any community that needed that's it. why I, I would apply to the um you know homeland security council and then you know potentially we could set aside some like fifty thousand yeah. dollars or something yeah it's, it's just um, that would be like a third of our money. Oh, of course, right. And, and it yes. would be like yeah. nobody else would do um, anything. And, and, and like I so said, I have we no would fund all our training and stuff. I have no disillusion yeah. about you know what position. But by the advisor doesn't counsel. hurt to ask. And by no, localizing no, no, by, it, uh, no, by organizing it, then you right. over, oh, you open up and and you also to leverage seed. right, and you're also leveraging. Yeah. So right. you know right. if we can come up with fifty. And then, then AFG maybe, says, oh, oh, Homeland Security is going to pay fifty. AFG, we only have to pay you know a hundred, and then yeah, yeah, let's look at this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you might be able to have four or five partners. Well, and then if there are other people's other people in the community who know about the grant money that may be available yes. that nobody has thought of. So I think it's good to organize it and put it in a, uh, in a good thing. And John and I are both on the council, mm -hmm. so that's at least two votes. But well, I know John isn't going to vote for it, or at least no. not full funded. No, 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 but I can't either. Because yeah. that would, yeah. you know, would defund all our training right, of course. Um, of course. for years. Um, but, um, and I, wouldn't, I, I certainly wouldn't want to rob people of training. For, no, yeah, well, I, I mean, that's basically what all we're doing right now is doing training. All right. We're not, we're not buying equipment. Right? And the, yeah. the last thing, and really, I mean, you could do a vote of the boo for this, but we don't even need to. But uh, So here's the deal. So um, this is a very long paragraph. I'm going to try to sum it up quick, and you know how good I am at summing things up. County retirement acknowledges public safety people. Um as more strenuous work, more dangerous work. So on one side, they want to reward that and they want to allow people to retire a little bit earlier. On the flip side is you want people out of this job earlier. You don't want people working in public safety deep until their 60s just because of the demands of the job, uh, both physically and, and mentally. So county retirement recognizes public safety. It's called group four and allows them to generally retire a little bit earlier, um, you know, maybe three or four years earlier, but you achieve your maximum pension at a, at a faster rate. Because of the wording in the original law, it said fire departments and police departments. Yeah, right? So <laughs> up until now, South County EMS is EMS public safety. We've been grouped in with janitorial and groundskeepers. So it's basically clerical staff that might have to use chemicals is, is, mm -hmm. the, is group two is what we're in. So the explanation from the retirement board is on a case by case basis, we, they review everybody who's retired and they award them whatever their annuity, their pension, their retirement is going to be. And if you are EMS, you would retire under group two and then you would appeal that ruling. And then they would look at your job description and say, oh, yeah, you should have been group four this whole time. You're right. We're going to now let you retire at group four. But this creates th one of three problems. One, if the individual is denied their appeal, they lose out on the additional benefits they would have received if they had just stayed in the job. Two, if they wait to retire on fear of losing their appeal, it negates 
mm -hmm. and even appealing in the first place. Or three, they retire early, win the appeal, but then after the fact, by being in group four, it means that we've shortchanged the paid in. We haven't paid in enough to cover those obligations. Mm -hmm. So the wh one of those three things will happen, and it's all against the spirit of what this is supposed to be. So to address those issues, the law was recently changed. And now the law says that EMS people can be in group four by a simple vote of the select board, the appointing authority. So in our case, it would be the Deerfield Select Board. So I worked with Dale, I want to get his last name correct here, Dale Kowacki. He's the executive director of the Franklin County Retirement, and he crunched the numbers. So he, he researched the law, he talked to the legal counsel, it says what it looks like it says, and he wanted to know what would this look like, just, just for whatever. If the full-time employees at South County EMS tomorrow were changed from group two to group four, it would increase the, I don't know the, the correct word, burden, it, retirement systems employer cost. It would increase it by only 45, his estimate was $45,901. And that's out of the total 7.3 million. So it would increase the employer cost like that. And he says that that estimation he believes is on the high side because he always rounds up, and it also doesn't include um, any offsets that they would see from their stock market investments. So that's like a worst case scenario. And he put this in perspective for me. I met with him the other day for a couple hours. He goes, that addition, that $45,000, is akin to the Mohawk School District replacing a handful of teachers with paraprofessionals because they come off of the state retirement and go on to their own, or the Orange Police Department hiring a few new officers. Um, and he said that if we wanted to, if we went through this, he could conceivably just send a bill to South County um, for that $45,000. But typically, that's not what happens. If the Mohawk School District decides to fire some teachers and hire some paraprofessionals or Orange Fire hires a couple of officers, they just do it. It's their community. And then the rest of the retirement system just kind of absorbs that along the way. So it might grow by 45 here, it might shrink by 60, it might grow by 30, it might shrink by five, that type of thing. And so he said that with that perspective, that $45,000, he like wouldn't even be a blip on some of these communities. He goes, they may notice it, they might not. Um, and that is just kind of the way that the retirement system flows. Um, so I, this is where I kind of get on my soapbox. I mean, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I would benefit from this. Um, but, and I'm going to read what I wrote here because I thought I did such a good job. Considering the spirit of the original law, it seems reasonable that EMS agencies would have been included from the beginning had their eventual existence had been anticipated. And additionally, South County EMS providers, they deserve the recognition for the job that they do in parity with their public safety cohorts when it comes to retirement benefits. And finally, considering the small impact this recognition would have on the overall system and the fiscal and ethical obligation we have to fund the system, should those providers be inevitably granted Group 4 status anyway, it's my opinion that we recognize them through the town of Deerfield as em employees of Group 4, that it's obligatory, that we either owe it to the system financially or we owe it to the individual um, for their own benefits. Uh, that's where I stand on it. <laughs> So That's the research. where are we now after your tour meeting and somebody, does the psych board have to vote on it? Yeah. It would have to go, it would have to be a recommendation from the oversight board. The oversight board would have to, you know, vote to recommend this to the select board and the select board would then put it on the agenda to vote. I think that's good form. I don't think this, the oversight board would even have to recommend because we're employees of the town of Deerfield. It'd be no different than the personnel committee setting the cola for the Except, next year. Well, I, no, I, like, I agree. I think it's, I think it's good form. Um, I, I just feel like the oversight board needs to be, at, like, like when right. I wanted to come back yeah. 
for you know the acknowledgement of the exposure for mm -hmm. you know potential for injury. I want yeah. to be clear that we are acknowledging that the, there is exposure and that we would pay for it because we think it, the benefits right. outweigh the risks. I mean, I, I just, I, I like the idea of it being more transparent and, and everybody agreeing um, because it is an yeah. additional cost. But it is a, a marginal cost and, and if everyone is going to appeal anyway, which would seem correct, I mean, if, if you wanted to retire, At, at I the end of the it. day, we owe it to the employees not to make them have to go through that process to appeal. I know, I think they've done their work terrible. here to serve yeah. the community. And yeah. there might be others outside of this area that look at this and why should we pick up the cost of this? Think about how many times our service goes out of town to provide mutual aid, be it up to Conway, be it to Greenfield, be it Turner's, wherever else it is. Well, I agree, we're, we're a county asset. Right. And on the county numbers that you presented, the 45,901 over the seven, it's almost 7.4 million, it's six tenths of a percent. I know. That's why I don't feel guilty about having the system so, absorb it. Yeah, I mean, and if the system absorbs it and then just increases everybody's rate to pay in, well, and I, you know, I feel like it's a county asset because yeah. we, we respond. We are we are especially when they changed. Look at when they changed um, providers up here. We we filled the gap right. for for Greenfield, right. and and so. Well, we we still are SRT. Little, yeah. We're talking about all these other things that you know. Yeah. We're so not I, just. I don't, I don't feel. I don't feel bad, but I would feel as a select board that I would want the recommendation to come from the. So just vote. So you could on. write up a letter for next meeting, and we'll vote on it, like your last paragraph has, and talk to Dale and see if that's the kind of wording he wants. And yeah. Yeah, Dale was can, like, he goes. We can vote on it. He goes, it's as simple, the, so he goes, according to the law and what legal says, the select board just needs to vote. We hereby move to move the EMS people to group four. And he goes, mm -hmm. and, and just like that, it would, you know. So there probably, so like probably no other towns would have would complain about this, right? I like, I, I mean, the, I, I just don't. If any other towns want to complain, they don't complain about it. But at the end of the day, EMS personnel are exposed to just as much in a different way than what fire or police. No, they don't carry guns, they don't get shot at, typically. No, they don't run into burning buildings, typically. But the, the mental trauma and the physical trauma that you go through in taking care of your fellow person in the community. Just look at us. Yeah. <laughs> but look at the risks. You, know, I mean, you have risks. Oh, you no, have, there were risks. Risk. I, if there's... We're talking about... You tell me if I'm wrong. You've got your experience. I know David, if he was here. I still have and PTSD, whatever we want to call it, and I don't compare myself to a soldier because God yeah. knows what they've been through, but I still have nightmares about calls where you've gone out to help somebody and you've witnessed things that nobody should have to witness. Right. And you've done things that nobody should have to do. And this is what we expect. Well, and we're talking about potentially doing well checks in, in a crisis, pandemic crisis, or whatever. So, yeah. I, mean, I mean, just in, in what they do every day today. And needles. I mean, oh my gosh. I don't yeah. Know. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with it, okay? Yeah. I, but I do feel like it should come as a recommendation to the sector. And, and Dale, I mean, I think after two hours with Dale, I can. I have a good idea of what his position is. Mm -hmm. He thought that this number was ridiculously trivial. He, you know, because he's like any one of these communities tomorrow could decide, like he said, th these were his examples. Right. Mohawk wants to save some money, so they fire some teachers and hire some paraprofessionals. Yeah. And what it does is that the teachers are on a different retirement and the paraprofessionals are on county. And just like that, you know, the overall 7.4 goes up by $45,000. But We've never noticed it, right? Yeah. Because the whole system is doing this the yeah. whole time. And that Mohawk school district would never come down to Deerfield or Whaley and say, would it be okay if, yeah. you know, I we know, just, I know. so. I he, just didn't know if there yeah. was any kind of trigger or anything. Nope, nope. Okay. He, he was really unimpressed by that $45,000 value. And, he, and that's when he said, he goes, if, if it really mattered, he goes, I could bill you directly. But he's like, I don't think that makes any sense. It just, yeah. that's not how the system's designed to work. And yeah. it's not how it. Okay, no, so. that's fine. Um.
Any other discussion to come before the board? No, that's it. I've exhausted everything. Meetings with the finance committees have been going well. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, I've gone in front of the Waitley Finance Committee who asked some good questions but didn't raise any concerns. They didn't vote in my presence, but I didn't get the impression that they were going to have any issue. The Deerfield Finance Committee, same thing, asked good questions, didn't raise any concerns, and they did vote in my presence and voted to recommend our um, 21 budget. Um, I haven't heard from the Sunderland I don't, maybe they don't, does Sunderland still exist? It's still over there. <laughs> um, I haven't heard. On the side of the bridge. Normally I would have heard by now for an appointment in front of their finance committee, but. They're still not worried about it. I guess they're not yeah. worried about it. I mean, they've, I've supplied them with all the budgets and all the documents, so. Um, so, so, Whitley voted the indirect costs that we came up with? Yes, they are. Waitley is very concerned about the rent money not going into a an account in Deerfield for this building. They they are very concerned. I spoke on behalf of the town of Deerfield. I said I feel confident. You know, th there's no there's no squirmy business going on, and I was um, informed that uh, it was bold of me to go out on a limb for Deerfield and say that because of, you know, reasons. And I said, no, 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 like this, it's, you will see a warrant article for this at town meeting. And then, you know, so. The warrant article will move the money from this past year into it. And then the, the current year. Yeah. I mean, the upcoming. Right, so we got to create the, we have to create the account. We have to eventually move the money into it. That's, yeah. Can and we have the account. Okay. What we don't have is the warrant article hasn't been sufficiently vetted to have maximum flexibility. All right. I, I, I had a quick little we, email back and forth with Casey today. And so she's, I think she asked about this and I told her where I thought we were. So I, I will, we'll, I'll bring it up tomorrow. I'm supposed to meet with her tomorrow. So we're supposed um, to go over some stuff. So let me, um, uh, let me write it down so I don't forget. But, um, the reason why it was withdrawn from our special town meeting. It just was, wasn't ready for prime time. Uh, no. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. no one reviewed it. We didn't even review yeah. it here. Yeah. So I would put on the agenda the warrant article to for review for March. Um, and I'll try to um, um, have it done by, because we have to have it for our warrant. So I'll have it for the 19th. Do we have a sense of what Waitley is looking for so that they are comfortable with this? Is it just a warrant article? Do they want a phone call with Brenda to talk to their town accountant to talk to them about the way it's They're, being handled? They, they want our the rent money for this building to go into the fund to protect this building right. in the future. And they're just worried that that hasn't happened yet. And, and they don't want that money to end up in a general Gen fund funds. where now it's being used. We're going to borrow from it in order. Right. We'll pay it back. They're, they just they want all that just to be settled. Um, and it, yeah. it, it will be. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just it's just like I said, I wanted maximum flexibility. And it wasn't clear to me that that was a maximum flexibility. Yeah, that's fine. I, yeah. Right. And I that it was OK, but it didn't and it was OK, like for like repaving repaving our um you know yes parking lot. right right but it was not clear that it could be used to add on additional bay yeah and i think the that the special town meeting that that was just like an unfortunate somebody I, uh diana was like hey is there anything and i sent an email that said weren't we supposed to and then the next thing we knew there was one but then it hadn't been cleared so we had to put, I didn't even and know so about it. right I didn't so it looked all about the special it, town. it looked worse because it was put on and then removed instead of just being like oh we're going to save that for annual type thing so um didn't that's all. yeah i I, I didn't even know that we were going to have a town meeting special okay. town meeting plus then i saw it was the first time i saw the why would they tell you any of it? But then the first time I saw the horn article was that night. <laughs> does do you need to call Jonathan on this to put Jonathan in it, or it doesn't matter? We'll just wait till the next meeting. Not that Waitley's feelings. I, I I appreciate Waitley's concern, and I think I've made it clear a couple times that I want to make sure the account is set up and that the expenses for the building come out of the account. There's some type of an annual report that shows here's what went in, here's what we paid, here's what the balance is, so that everybody's clear on what it is. 
Um, the and intention I think of this the past year we've only we've spent maybe five thousand bucks, so and that's somewhere. fine. Yeah, but we have accounting. For right. It. We'll have accounting. We'll report it annually. This way, everybody's clear on what's there Absolutely. and what's not there. No what's one been wants paid. to be shyster. And, yeah, and and I was <sighs> I was referencing the statements of one finance committee member in Waitley. You and, know, and like you know, I, I I want to respect so. the concerns. I want to make sure. No more than we started this thing. There were all kinds of concerns. <laughs> Put them to bed. Mm -hmm. Let's do what we need to do to make sure it's done right and put it to bed so that no more than the way you're going through finance committees, you wouldn't have done this five years ago. It was a war in mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. to get through. Well, so. and that's why I want everything to be th yep. go through the boo on the standard because yep. so it can be very transparent. That's, that's why whatever Warren article we're putting forward will come through here and be vetted here yeah. to make sure that no And then no that changes. one article has to be an annual on, every, on, and it will be on the annual. meeting to be transferred. But I, like Let's I get said, it right the first time yes. so it can be repeated Well, that's why I didn't want to have to correct it. Okay. And it wasn't clear yeah. that we could do an addition onto the building. And to me, that's a huge... Yeah. Oh, I agree. The new expenses yeah. that potentially could come. If we don't know what's going to happen with the with the medical insurance situation, it's, it changes year to year, sometimes every couple months. So we have to be flexible, mm -hmm. and I wanted the money to be flexible, right. so that we could respond to make sure that we keep a viable, good service. Mm -hmm. And if we need to expand, then we're going to have to expand. If we're going to, if we don't need to worry about it, we don't need to worry about it. But. Okay. I want yeah. maximum flexibility. Okay. Any other new business? No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get on That's that. That's okay. But I'm trying, I've, I was a little bit defensive on that. No, I understand. Shinish whole accusation there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Motion to adjourn? Second. All right, thank you. All in favor? Aye. All right.